very excited to be talking about the big game. You know which one I'm talking about. The big one that happened on Sunday. It was huge. It was on national TV. Two of the very best teams going at it. It was fantastic. Let's talk Grizzlies Celtics on this episode of Lockdown Grizzlies. Wait, you thought I was talking about something else? You are Locked On Grizzlies, your daily Memphis Grizzlies podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to this episode of Locked On Grizzlies. I am your host for this episode, Joe Monax. Thank you for hanging out with me. Thank you for hanging out with Locked On Grizzlies, who is a proud part of the Locked On Podcast Network. We are with you each and every day, your team each and every day, free and available wherever you get your podcasts. You can also check us out over on YouTube, like, comment, rate, review, subscribe, all those fun things. Make us a part of your NBA content, Memphis Grizzlies content experience each and every day. It is appreciated. This episode of Locked On Grizzlies is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn jobs help you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. I am flying solo again here. Joe Mullinax, formerly of Grizzly Bear Blues over at SB Nation. Now I write for SB Nation NBA and fan sided and I have my sub stack written in the dark that hopefully you've checked out a time or two. My co-host, Michael Cole, the Grizzlies beat writer for the commercial appeal there in Memphis. Unable to join us on this episode. Got some things going on. Happy to have him back later in the week. Looking forward to chatting with DeMichael about this Grizzlies team again. And obviously there's a lot to discuss coming out of the big national stage game that the Grizzlies had against the Boston Celtics. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when you look at this Grizzlies team, which by the way, sorry for you know leading you on thinking that I was going to talk Super Bowl 57 on here. I'm not interested in talking football right now. I'm not a Chiefs guy. I'm not an Eagles guy. I'm not even a Rihanna guy, to be honest with you. Not huge on Rihanna as the Super Bowl halftime show. She's going to do a great job. I'm sure she did. She did a great job. But not for me. I didn't see it. Sorry. Not my, not my bag. You know what is my bag? Memphis Grizzlies basketball. And the Grizzlies were the national game on the big stage before Super Bowl 57. Obviously on ABC, there were only two NBA games in the entire association. Yesterday, the Memphis Grizzlies were the big one taking on the best team in the National Basketball Association, at least in my opinion, the Boston Celtics. We'll talk about where Memphis fits in the Western Conference, how Luke Kennard and Dylan Brooks looked in particular in this game. But just general takeaways from a Boston Celtics win a uh, pretty decisive win. In terms of the score, it was 119 to 109, but it, it was not that close, at least not in my opinion. And I'll give you a couple of reasons why. Uh, first off, the rebounding differential was, was drastic. Uh, the Grizzlies just are not a very good rebounding team without Steven Adams. They were a minus 20, the Grizzlies were, in rebounding. The Boston Celtics out-rebounded Memphis 54 to 34. It's extremely difficult to win basketball games when you're not able to clean the glass. And the Celtics did an exceptional job of that. They grabbed 14 offensive rebounds in particular to the Grizzlies three. And chances are, if you're listening to or watching this podcast, you know exactly why that is in the case of the Memphis Grizzlies. Who would have thunk that Steven Adams is one of the most important Memphis Grizzlies players? I would say at this stage, you could argue outside of the big three of John ja Morant, Jaron Jackson Jr., and Desmond Bain, Steven Adams is fourth. Would Memphis miss Dylan Brooks? Yes, absolutely. I would say his defense on Jason Tatum suggests that, and we'll talk more about that later on in the show. But in terms of Adams' rebounding, his screen setting, which was better for Memphis at times in this game between Jaron Jackson Jr., Brandon Clark set a bruising screen to get Luke Kennard open for his 1-3 that he made in his Grizzlies debut. So there's areas of improvement there. But Steven Adams is just so big, so strong, so dominant in those particular areas. The Grizzlies missed him pretty terribly. They miss him every game, but it really shined through against Boston in the Celtics having those 14 offensive rebounds. Boston didn't need the extra possessions. They shot pretty well, especially from three. And that leads us into the other reason that, you know, 
Memphis only lost by 10, but it certainly could have been more. 41.2% shooting from three on 51 attempts. In case you're not a math major, that is 21 made three-point shots. The Grizzlies made 12, which is roughly average for them, right? 35-ish percent from beyond the arc. Not terrible for the Grizzlies. And they shot well inside the arc. They shot 50% overall, Memphis did, and they dominated in the paint. But unfortunately, shots in the paint are only worth two points, whereas shots from beyond the arc are worth three points. And the Boston Celtics dominated in that area. And it wasn't the guys that you would perhaps expect, right? Um, Jalen Brown, not available due to injury. You had uh, Malcolm Brogdon, unavailable due to injury. Marcus Smart also didn't play. So Boston was down three rotation players in this game. And Jason Tatum, again, we'll talk more about it here in a moment, did not have the best evening or the best afternoon. It was a matinee there at TD Garden. So for Boston, their best player, bad game. Their second best player didn't play. And yet I am telling you that in case you missed the game, maybe you were getting ready for your Super Bowl party, whatever the case might be, the Grizzlies could have been down by a lot more than just 10 at the end of that game. So what made the difference? Well, it was Sam Hauser, right? Sam Hauser of University of Virginia fame, making six of his 11 three-point shots. It was Al Horford making four out of seven shots. It was Derek White making four out of nine shots. Peyton Pritchard making four out of seven. It was the other guys making these threes, stepping up. And it makes sense that in a home game, that would happen, right? Role players do that all the time. You see them having better performances in their home arenas because they're comfortable. They're around their fans, their rims, shooting in their arenas. It's much easier to find lines of sight and get your rhythm. All those reasons make sense why the Boston Celtics had success. But they had so much success that it covered up the fact that Jalen Brown wasn't out there, covered up that Jason Tatum had an off night, and those made threes from those non-core players were the difference for the Boston Celtics. Take a look at the Grizzlies, on the other hand. Santi Aldama, two for 11 from the field, two for nine from three. Not a good night for him. Not a good day, not a good afternoon. He did not play well, and he struggled defensively at times as well. Then you have Dylan Brooks, who played well defensively. Again, we'll talk more about that here in a moment, but a four for 12. From the field. Luke Kennard, as good as the things I'm about to say about Luke are, only one made shot in his Grizzlies debut. So you look at the circumstances and situations that are around this team. And when the Boston Celtics out rebound you that substantially, when the Boston, Cel Boston Celtics outscore you from three that substantially, they're going to win. That's what's going to happen. They're going to pick up the victory. And that's exactly what occurred. Um, Xavier Tillman in this game played 24 minutes. He was three for three, but he only grabbed two rebounds. If Xavier Tillman is supposed to be your replacement for Steven Adams, because Steven Adams is out and he's not able to be productive on the glass, Xavier Tillman gra grabbed as many rebounds as Luke Kennard did. Luke Kennard grabbed two rebounds. Xavier Tillman grabbed two rebounds. Dylan Brooks grabbed two rebounds. But the difference between Brooks, Kennard, and Tillman is Tillman is supposed to be the guy that goes and cleans the glass. So I know Robert Williams is really good. Al Horford is strong. They've got bigs that can play on the perimeter, and that brings Tillman out a little bit, maybe takes him away from the glass as a rebounder. But if X isn't going to clean the glass, what is he doing out there? How is he benefiting the team? If Santi Aldama, who has played really well this season, one game does not a poor campaign make. But if Santi Aldama is going to shoot for two for 11, two for nine from beyond the arc, you don't really have a chance. It doesn't matter how good the other guys play. And John Morant played well, nine of 18, seven of 11 from the free throw line. You'd like to see that number up a little bit. But 25, seven and six, seven assists, six rebounds. Desmond Bain, three for seven from three, 18 points, seven assists, six rebounds. Jaron Jackson Jr. in limited minutes, which we'll talk more about, 15 points, seven rebounds in 20 minutes of play, three assists for Jaron. The big three can play as well as they want. If they don't have support, it's not going to matter. 
the Boston Celtics reserves were better than the other guys for the Grizzlies. And that led to the rebound and three point differences. And that is what made the Boston Celtics winners on Sunday and the Grizzlies losers. We'll talk about Dylan Brooks and Luke Kennard next here on Lockdown Grizzlies in particular with their performances. But first, this episode of Lockdown Grizzlies is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. As a small business owner or hiring manager, you know that success in 2023 depends on the team members that you surround yourself with. That's why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open jobs with the people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your goals. LinkedIn Jobs helps you quickly attract qualified candidates to your open jobs with targeting tools. You can identify the most qualified candidates on LinkedIn Jobs and connect with them fast and for free. It makes it easy to screen and rate applicants based on job qualifications on one platform, and it's why small businesses ranked LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash MBA. That's linkedin.com slash MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. We will be talking Kennard's debut and Dylan Brooks's defense on Jason Tatum next here on Locked On Grizzlies. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Locked On Grizzlies. I am your host, co-host. Usually when I'm joined by my wonderful friend, DeMichael Cole, he's not with me today. He won't be with me tomorrow either. So hopefully you'll get used to the solo Joe, at least for a couple of shows here, talking you through the Grizzlies game against the Boston Celtics. Obviously, we have a couple days off. The Grizzlies don't play again until Wednesday, given that the Super Bowl was Sunday and they're coming back from Boston. Logic would suggest that if they have a day off over the next couple of days, it'll be today. They'll likely practice at least one of these two days. And they've got to get Luke Kennard more situated. And that's going to be the first thing I want to talk about in this segment. Luke did some good things, considering he is not entirely comfortable in what the Memphis Grizzlies are trying to do at this stage. But he's only been on the team for, what, 72 hours? So the fact that he had the showing that he did, in my opinion, is a promising sign. The first thing that he did was just exist in the corner. Right. And again, in terms of understanding the basics of the offense, that's the main reason they brought Luke Kennard in. That guy shoots 52 percent on corner threes per cleaning the glass. Fifty two percent. Do you want him standing in the corner instead of John Conchar? You bet your sweet tail you do. That's who I want in the corner. That's who I want on that wall. I want Luke Kennard shooting that three. I want Nuke to go nuclear all over the place, dropping three bombs. Obviously, that didn't happen against Boston, but Luke's role in the offense is pretty basic at this point because he doesn't fully understand what Memphis is trying to do. So as he stands in the corner, he and his presence force teams to respect his range. So when John Morant drove in the third quarter numerous times, when the Grizzlies had their best quarter of the game, which was that third quarter, Memphis was impressive in that third quarter. They competed well. In that third quarter, they outscored Boston by 12 in the third quarter. That was because in part of Luke Kennard's presence, that's when Ja Morant was able to get off and get going. It's impressive to watch Ja when he has room to operate. Defenses have collapsed on him consistently all season long. And don't get me wrong, they still collapsed. But the guy on, in, on the side that Ja drove on more often than not, as Luke Kennard stood in that corner, he was not able to come and collapse because if he had, Ja would have found him 52% of the time, at least to this point this season, Luke Kennard is making that three. So his presence, his physical existence in that space helps immensely. But beyond that, he did some other good things. He had some flashes of his ball handling creation. It wasn't specifically set up that way. It was when plan A of a set didn't work or after an offensive rebound, one of the few that they did get. Kennard would find the ball in his hands and he would do a little bit of ball handling and he looked about the way he did in Detroit, right? And that's what a lot of Grizzlies fans are holding on to, that Detroit highlight tape when he was playing as that secondary facilitator like Desmond Bain does for Memphis now. Kennard has shown flashes of the ability to do that. He wasn't asked to do that in Los Angeles for whatever reason. So if he can be that guy and help in that way and expand his offensive role eventually as he gets more comfortable, that'll be extremely valuable. Another thing that I really appreciated about Luke Kennard was his defense. He took a charge. I'm a big fan of taking charges. If you didn't know that about me, now you do. I think that's a wonderful tool defensively, especially when you're not as athletic 
as a guy that you're going against to predict or understand the angle of where he's trying to get to, to position your body. You have the right to that space first and to give your body up. I think that's good defense. Not everybody agrees with me on that, but I think that's playing good defense. I like guys that take charges and Luke Kennard took one in the Celtic game. So I was immediately in love with him even more than I already was. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, he moved better laterally than I thought he would. And and Luke Kennard is never going to be Dylan Brooks, who we're about to talk about here in a moment. He's never going to be that level of defender. He's just not. But what Luke Kennard can be is a competent team defender that doesn't hurt you in that area. Watching that game, I thought Santi Aldama had a worse game defensively, which we've talked about here on Lockdown Grizzlies a little bit, needing more out of Santi in terms of his defense. I thought Kennard was better than Santi. I thought there were times where Kennard looked like he was being left out to dry because Santi wasn't making a rotation or wasn't communicating a cut or whatever the case might be. And I think Kennard showed the capacity to be a decent defender. Again, that's probably the best he can be. I'm not trying to make an argument for him being a two-way three and D wing. That's not who Kennard is. He is in Memphis because he is elite at shooting the basketball, not because they're counting on him to be a defensive stopper. But it's good to see that he has the physical capacity to at least be able to keep guys in front of him. Somebody else who has the physical capacity to keep guys in front of him is Dylan Brooks. And he's got it and then some, right? This was a game for Dylan offensively. He got hot early, made a couple of threes. And if you followed this team for a while, if you followed Dylan Brooks's career for a while, you know that sometimes that's not the best thing. For Dylan to get going early because his confidence shoots to an all-time high. He thinks it's going to be his night. And sometimes it is, and more often than not, it's not on the offensive end. But one of the positives of those shots going down early is that confidence building. And while Jason Tatum, you know, he's banked up, there's all sorts of excuses and reasons for why he had the performance he had. I think we got to give Dylan Brooks his flowers a little bit because one of the reasons Jason Tatum had the game that he had is because of Dylan freaking books. Brooks, excuse me. Tatum was three of 16 from the field, three of 16. The only reason that Tatum scored 16 points was he had nine made free throws, nine out of 12 from the charity strike. Tatum was one for eight from beyond the arc. Just for comparison's sake, Al Horford, Sam Hauser, Derek White, Peyton Pritchard, Mike Muscala, all better three-point shooters in this game than Jason Tatum. That's not just because Jason Tatum's banged up, and it's not just because Jason Tatum didn't have Jalen Brown and Marcus Smart and Malcolm Brogdon, and he had to take a different role in the offense. You got to give Dylan Brooks some credit. He is a physical player. He is capable of defending guys like Tatum because of his capacity for physicality, because of his wind. We don't talk about that enough. Dylan Brooks is in extremely good condition. You watch him run like a crazy person all over the floor. He is a physical player that has the cardio in place to be able to be that level of guy for a vast majority of the time that he's on the floor. You rarely watch Dylan Brooks play and think, oh, he took that playoff. Oh, he didn't, he didn't run the floor on that possession. That doesn't happen very often. Again, he's not perfect. Maybe it's happened a few times. But 99.9% .9 of the time when Dylan Brooks is on that basketball court, he is giving you 100% effort. And that's exactly what he did to Jason Tatum. Physicality, players today don't like it. You could argue players never really like the physicality in basketball. But I'm a big believer in basketball being a contact sport. And Dylan Brooks is as well. Dylan Brooks fully embraces the physicality. He will dive on top of you. He will attack you like the Grizzlies did against the Minnesota Timberwolves on Friday night. There will be physical hell to pay when you are playing against Dylan Brooks. It's one of the ways that he gets under your skin, being overly aggressive and dealing with the consequence of it come what may in terms of fouls. Dylan does pick up a decent amount of fouls in this particular game. Dylan only had three fouls in 36 minutes of play. Kudos to him. Extremely impressive. For comparison, Jaron Jackson Jr., in my opinion, the defensive player of the year, six personal fouls in 20 minutes of play. That hurt the Grizzlies to lose Jaron. Jaron is extremely vital to this team, especially with Steven Adams out. So when you lose Jaron, you know the Memphis defense is not as good. To have Dylan out there to Locked down Tatum. He wasn't able to do much else. He's not going to be able to be that impact rim protector or anything like that. But what Dylan ex excels at is going against the best scorer, the best player on the opposing team, and getting in their head, being physical with them, and putting them in a vice, essentially, 
for 48 minutes or however long it takes for the game to complete. So Dylan had a good game defensively in particular, offensively, maybe not so much, but I, I felt positive watching Kennard and Brooks together. Cause I think those two guys have games that will complement each other. Well, in a jaw, uh, Kennard Brooks, eventually, uh, Aldama and Clark, or eventually Adams and Jaron Jackson Jr. However, they structure that rotation would probably be the latter, It'd probably be Aldama and Clark, or uh, Aldama and Adams, excuse me. A Morant, Kennard, Brooks, Aldama, Adams, five is intriguing for a variety of reasons that I'm sure we'll continue to talk about here on Locked On Grizzlies. We'll talk about the Western Conference, the lay of the land after the trades, who we think will or won't rise and compare to the Grizzlies next. But first, this episode of Locked On Grizzlies is brought to you by FanDuel. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download the FanDuel app, America's number one sports book. New customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sports app. It is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and three-point strain. Player props, core markets, spread, money line, so many more exclusive bets like two three-pointers scored in the first three minutes. Literally anything that you can think of almost can be bet on at FanDuel. Plus, they let you combine your bets for a same-game parlay for a chance at a bigger payout. Don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Who do we fear in the Western Conference, if anybody, next here on Locked On Grizzlies? Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Locked On Grizzlies. I am your host, Flying Solo. Once again, Joe Molinax. To Michael Cole will be back with us later this week. Excited to have him back to talk Grizzlies basketball again. But you and I were having a good conversation talking about Grizzly Celtics, some things that we liked, some things that we didn't like from that game, some promising signs from Brook, um, or Dylan Brooks and Luke Kennard, some not-so-promising signs in terms of rebounding and the three-pointers made and who made the threes for Boston. A lot of that encapsulates a lot of the concerns with this Grizzlies team right now. Obviously, they've cool the stumble the ascent into the abyss has calmed down a little bit they've won a couple of games they found their footing they're still pretty solidly the two seed in the western conference a couple games ahead of the number three seed currently sacramento but with that being said after the trade deadline you know john miranda infamously said he feels fine in the west and to michael and i last week talked about you know thinking that memphis is worse than phoenix or that Memphis is worse than the Clippers. The Grizzlies could potentially be upset by a Lakers team if that matchup came now that the Lakers have some actual depth behind them or behind their best players in LeBron and Anthony Davis. Watching the Celtics game made me think a little bit more about where I see the Memphis Grizzlies playing and laying out in terms of the structure of the NBA hierarchy because the Boston Celtics are a very clear NBA championship contender. Right, They were recently in the NBA Finals. They are physically talented. They have youth on their side. They have depth. That was the biggest thing that stood out to me watching the Celtics compared to the Grizzlies. The depth of those two teams was entirely different. There is no Sam Hauser hitting six threes on the Grizzlies bench. John Conchar is not doing that on 11 attempts. He's just not. Luke Kennard, maybe. Tyus Jones, no. Brandon Clark, heck no. So Memphis doesn't have those kinds of dudes, and Boston has a plethora of them. So for a variety of reasons, the Celtics are viewed as a better favorite than the Grizzlies, and they should be. Compare that to the Western Conference, and outside of the Phoenix Suns, who, assuming health, if you assume health for the Grizzlies, you got to assume it for everybody else. Assuming health, Chris Paul, Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, Torrey Craig, DeAndre Ayton, holy crap. That is a hell of a starting five. Terrence Ross is going to be joining them in the buyout market. I'm sure there'll be other names coming in in the next couple of days. It's enough to make you ponder and think, you know, can Memphis really compete with that group in a seven game series? But if you go down the, the list and the conference, and again, watching the Celtics game kind of impacted my thoughts on this a little bit. 
The Grizzlies, you have to remember, are not built to be that level of contender. Luke Kennard coming to Memphis is not this widening of the window like the Grizzlies tried to do when they tried to give up every first-round pick of their own, probably not the Golden State Warriors pick. But they offered, according to Hoops Hype, they offered every single first-round pick that they have for Kevin Durant. KD chose Phoenix, understandable. But that's 2023, 2024, 25, 26, 27. That's seven first-round picks that they tried to get for KD. They offered four first-round picks for Mikel Bridges. The Grizzlies did. That's a pretty drastic decision. That's a heck of a lot of capital. That's going all in, which is what I and others have flirted with. Clearly, there isn't a ton of flirtation on the Grizzlies side. It takes two to tango in those, in, in those results, and Brooklyn didn't want to do business with Memphis in that way. But the fact remains that Zach Kleiman, the GM of these Grizzlies, understands that those types of moves would put them in a more direct conversation to be a championship contender. Luke Kennard is not that. Luke Kennard will help with their depth. Luke Kennard will help with their half-court offense like he did in the third quarter against the Boston Celtics. In terms of just physical existence in the corner, you can't help off of that guy as a shooter. You can't. He will hurt you. Even if it's John Morant driving to the basket, he's going to be John Morant's best friend. They're going to work really well together. Outside of Phoenix, though, you know, the Denver Nuggets getting, you know, Thomas Bryant, Denver Nuggets, Reggie Jackson joining them as a backup point guard, a little bit more depth. Denver was always going to be a challenging team as the season got fully more realized, and it was Denver and Memphis at the top. But do I think the Grizzlies are going to get swept by the Denver Nuggets? No. Do I, do I worry about the Clippers with Eric Gordon and, you know, Bones Highland and those types? A Plumley brother? No, not necessarily. The Lakers could upset the Grizzlies. The Lakers could also implode and not make the playoffs at all. So what's the point I'm trying to make? The point I'm trying to make is after watching the Celtics play, that is what an NBA champion looks like or a contending team looks like. That is what a squad that understands what it will take to get to that level appears to be. They are who we thought they were, like Denny Green, the former NFL coach said. Cool. Good for them. What does that mean for the Grizzlies? It means without Mikel Bridges, without Kevin Durant, they're probably not in their conversation. But after watching the Boston Celtics, I'm not sure those other teams are either. Because again, if you don't have Kevin Durant, if you don't have a LeBron James, and again, the, the fact of the matter is LeBron was at the Super Bowl the day before a game in Portland. The Lakers play Portland tonight. He was in Arizona watching Chiefs Eagles. I the the Lakers may not even make the playoffs. So if the Lakers don't make the playoffs, they don't have to worry about that. Denver has Nikola Jokic. He deserves respect as a tremendous talent. Jamal Murray, Aaron Gordon. There's talented guys, Michael Porter Jr. But the Clippers haven't put it all together yet. The Clippers haven't gotten to that level. The Sacramento Kings are a hell of a story, one of the best offenses in the NBA, but they'll struggle defensively hanging with the Grizzlies, especially now that Kennard is there to help with spacing in those staggered units that Taylor Jenkins likes to employ, the head coach of the Grizzlies. After watching the Celtics, it actually had the opposite effect, perhaps, that it should have. I don't know if the Grizzlies can beat the Boston Celtics in a seven-game series. But I also don't know that about the Denver Nuggets. I also don't know that about the L.A. teams. Hopefully you're seeing the Dallas Mavericks with Kyrie Irving now. Hopefully you're seeing the point I'm trying to make. The parity is still there in the Western Conference, even with Phoenix doing what they did. The Phoenix Suns deserve to be in the top of the league, of the conference conversation. Same thing with Denver. To me, those are the two clear teams that if you're picking favorites for the Western Conference Finals, it's them at this moment. Then everybody else. The Grizzlies would be the top of everybody else. So we have to get better at drawing a line in terms of what our expectations are. I still expect them to compete to make the Western Conference Finals. I Now that Kennard is in the fold and they actually made a move to improve the roster, I expect them to be competitive in the second round. And they have to hang with a team like a Denver or like a Phoenix or like a Dallas. I expect them to be in that mix and find a way, push a series to six or seven games and try to get to the Western Conference Finals. Because 
Boston is a championship contending team. Phoenix, in theory, is as well after the Kevin Durant trade without giving up Devin Booker or DeAndre Ayton or Chris Paul. The Denver Nuggets deserve credit for the success they're having with Jokic. But beyond those teams, nobody else is a true championship contender. Memphis is the closest to those guys of anybody else out there. The Milwaukee Bucks are in the East, not worried about them right now. Maybe they're in that conversation. Philadelphia 76ers, same kind of deal. Maybe they're in that to- that conversation. We know Brooklyn Nets aren't anymore. The Grizzlies are a tier below Boston, but so is almost everybody else that's going to be in that seeding range of two to six in either conference. And with that in mind, you roll out a ball, you compete as best you can, and Memphis still has that future flexibility that is so valuable in trying to do future business, whether it's in the draft or to go get a fish like a Bridges. So that that's positivity for me coming out of watching that Celtics game. The Celtics are a level above. Can Memphis get there? Perhaps. Probably not, but maybe. I don't know if a lot of other teams are going to be able to get there either, aside from you know the Phoenix and Denvers of the world. Thank you for making Locked On Grizzlies your first listen today. Now make your second listen Game to Game NBA. Every moment, every top performance, every result, Locked On Game to Game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked On NBA, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. On the next episode of Locked On Grizzlies, I'm going to do some lineup experimentation. I'm going to talk about some rotation ideas, trying to find best ways to use the newly uh, acquired Luke Kennard, some ways that maybe I'd be a little bit nervous to see those names trotted out there. And we're just going to go through a thought exercise of trying to construct a good, strong Grizzlies rotation, because that's been a concern of Grizzlies fans on Twitter and elsewhere. The rotations, how Taylor Jenkins staggers these guys trying to get more minutes for their best players. That's going to be part of our episode for Tuesday. Hopefully you'll be there with us. Until then, though, Make sure you're subscribing, liking, commenting, rating, reviewing, wherever you get your podcasts, as well as over on our YouTube page. It has been a tremendously successful last few days for our YouTube page, the best since I have come on here at Lockdown Grizzlies. I can't speak for DeMichael. He's been here a little longer than me. But it's been the best few days since I've come on, and I'm greatly appreciative of that. Continue to hit us up in the comments. Continue to have conversations. Make your voices heard. And if you have questions for us, maybe those are things that I can address or me and DeMichael in future episodes can address as well. So keep all those things going. You help make Lockdown Grizzlies a better podcast, a better source of NBA and Grizzlies content, and that is appreciated. I know it's appreciated by DeMichael, and it's certainly appreciated by me. Until Tuesday, stay locked in, Grizzlies fans. I'm Joe Molinax, and you have been watching and listening to Lockdown Grizzlies.